tonight, an unsettling discovery on some Boeing planes grounded after that terrifying mid-flight blowout. I was starting to text my, my girlfriend, didn't know if I was going to make it. The potentially dangerous flaw found on the same panel that left a gaping hole 16,000 feet up. And liftoff. A textbook launch, the first U.S. mission to the moon in 50 years, but then disaster. It doesn't appear a moon landing is in the cards. What went wrong? A growing battle in Canada's housing crisis. It's like my, my property was held hostage. When a tenant is asked to leave and won't unless the landlord pays up. It's legal, but is it fair? Landlords have been, you know, opening the caviar and popping the champagne. Yeah, I'm going to tell them to suck it up. We break down the debate over cash for keys. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. There's been a stunning discovery as airlines and investigators hunt for answers as to why a panel blew off a Boeing 737 MAX 9 plane mid-flight. United Airlines says inspections of its planes have uncovered a big problem, loose bolts. The panel, which was sealing an unused exit on an Alaska Airlines plane, blew out shortly after takeoff Friday, landing in a backyard in Oregon 16,000 feet below. Belongings and seat parts were sucked out of that hole. Incredibly, no people were. Now, those bolts could be a major clue, but others are emerging too. Katie Simpson on where the investigation stands tonight. Hundreds of flights canceled, planes grounded, inspections finding fresh safety concerns with the Boeing 737 MAX 9 all sparked by that emergency landing of an Alaska Airlines jet after a part of the fuselage the size of a fridge blew off the plane. And it was a described to us by the flight crew that it was a very violent, explosive event. United Airlines, which also uses the MAX 9, says it has discovered some installation issues with door plugs and bolts that needed additional tightening. Investigators also revealed the Alaska Airlines plane in question had issues before Friday's incident. Pressurization warning lights had gone off during three prior flights, but the plane was kept in service with orders not to fly long distances over water. It's not clear if that is at all related to the incident that terrified passengers. I thought, you know, we might be going down. What I sent to my mother was, the plane has exploded and I'm not sure what's going on, but I love you. The missing panel has finally been found. A school teacher in Portland discovered this in his backyard. My heart did start beating a little faster at that point because I thought, oh my goodness, people have been looking for this all weekend and it looks like it's in my backyard. Another man picked up a working phone on the side of the road. So I opened it up and it was in airplane mode with a travel confirmation and baggage claim for Alaska 1282. The incident is highlighting multiple long-standing NTSB concerns. It says cockpit voice recorders need longer preservation times. This one was automatically wiped clean before it was recovered. And it wants stricter safety rules for kids. Three babies were on board, each sitting on a passenger's lap. As clothing and headrests were ripped out of the plane, these kids had nothing but the strength of their caregivers keeping them inside. We would urge uh, passengers to, to put their children under two uh, in a FAA-approved car seat. So, Katie, I see you're at Reagan National Airport tonight in Virginia. What can travelers there and really everywhere expect at this point? Well, expect some airport misery. There will be more delays and cancellations. Most of the problems here in the U.S. since Canadian Airlines don't use the MAX 9, but there's always the chance of a ripple effect. Boeing says it regrets the impact on customers and supports the decision by regulators requiring these inspections. Now, it will take some time to carry out all of those inspections, and it could take some time before the public once again feels confident in these planes. Adrian. All right, Katie Simpson, you're Washington, D.C. at the Reagan National Airport tonight. Thank you. The Manitoba government says change is coming to the Trans-Canada Highway at the site of the deadliest crash in the province's history.
Today it announced a $12 million commitment to improve safety at this intersection near the town of Carberry, west of Winnipeg. The review was commissioned after a fiery bus crash last June between a semi-trailer truck and a bus full of seniors out for a day trip. So these are the 17 people who died after the bus attempted to cross the Trans-Canada en route to a casino. Eight others were injured. There are still questions tonight about exactly how the intersection will be upgraded. Cameron McIntosh shows us the options and the reaction. 110 kilometers an hour, two lanes each way. Even in the blowing snow on Western Manitoba's Trans-Canada Highway, this is the traffic that passes through the intersection of Highway 5 near Carberry. Much the same now as it was last June, when 17 people, mostly from Dauphin, Manitoba, were killed after the minibus they were traveling in was struck by an oncoming semi-trailer as the bus was trying to cross over the Trans-Canada. You need to put a face to what has happened here. Adrian Zerba's mother, Claudia, was one of those killed. We need to make sure something gets done in that intersection. Now, it's not just the one big collision. Over the last decade, provincial numbers show there have been 29 collisions in that intersection, most of them right-angle collisions. Nearly half resulted in injuries or fatalities. We cannot make things right or make you whole, but we are going to work our hardest to ensure that something like this does not happen again. Manitoba's Premier says the intersection will be changed with one of three options. A wider median, giving vehicles trying to cross more room and time. A traffic circle, which would slow traffic on what is a fast stretch of road. Or an R-cut, restricted crossing U-turn intersection. In the U.S., they've been shown to reduce collisions. Instead of crossing over another highway, drivers are forced right into a dedicated U-turn lane and back with the flow of traffic. The province is also promising to help support a memorial in Dauphin, where the mayor says emotions are still raw. Trying to find that spot in between to be compassionate and caring, but to still be able to move on. Zerba says she still can't bring herself to visit the accident site, but is reassured by the promise to change it. I'm happy with it. It does give me some peace. Meanwhile, the RCMP is still investigating the crash, saying they haven't been able to interview the driver of the bus, who's still in the hospital. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Dauphin, Manitoba. At least 21 people have been injured in a suspected natural gas explosion in Fort Worth, Texas. There is a smell of gas in the area and, and there were windows and things that were blown outside of the structure. The blast ripped apart a historic building housing a hotel in the heart of the downtown and littered the street with metal, glass and chunks of pavement. One person was in critical condition and at least four others suffered serious injuries. Authorities say a restaurant in the hotel was under construction at the time. Now, families of victims and their supporters, including the Prime Minister, gathered to mark four years since the downing of flight PS752. The Iranian regime must be held accountable. Justin Trudeau went on to say his government continues to look into potentially listing the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organization. Two Iranian missiles destroyed the flight shortly after takeoff from Tehran, killing all 176 people aboard, the majority of them with ties to Canada. Canadian officials are expected to meet with Honda executives over a decision that could supercharge the auto sector, a multi-billion dollar investment in electric vehicles. Marina von Stackelberg looks at how likely a deal is. Honda's factory in southwestern Ontario could be central to Canada's electric vehicle transformation. According to reports in Japanese media, Honda is considering spending $18 billion to build EVs and batteries in Canada. Honda executives and Ottawa will meet this week. A decision is expected within a year. Canada makes sense for a lot of reasons, including they've got the relationship, they've got the land, they've got the suppliers, and the critical minerals for the batteries that they sound like they want to make uh, are all here and in an abundance in a way that don't exist in a lot of other places. Canada plans to phase out and then ban the sale of new gas and diesel passenger vehicles by 2035. That's prompted automakers to start talking with federal and provincial governments. Ottawa has already promised tens of billions to electric car makers Fiat Chrysler and Volkswagen. Honda would be a big get. It's very significant for the Japanese 
who are generally pretty cautious and only make moves when they're really ready to go. And oftentimes it marks a real transition point. Both Honda and Ottawa will not reveal details about potential discussions. All of those investments finding their way into Alliston, Ontario is, uh, is, is intoxicating, but unlikely. Automotive experts are mixed on whether Canada can close the deal. It would make more sense for them to be closer to their core manufacturing uh, organization, which is in Ohio. Honda established itself in, in Canada many, many years ago. Um, it's done very, very well. It's one of their best plants. The race to build electric vehicles and their batteries here is also driven by competition south of the border, where the United States is pouring hundreds of billions of dollars into electric vehicle subsidies. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived in Israel tonight, his seventh stop in the region as he rushes to contain and cool down Israel's war with Hamas. Israeli forces are turning their attention to central Gaza. The fighting now close to one of the few remaining hospitals overwhelmed by the wounded. They are seeing, in some cases, hundreds of casualties every day. Further south, in Rafah, a similar scene. One Israeli airstrike hit a car in a crowded neighborhood, killing three. <laughs> We're so scared, she said. We don't want war. We don't want war. But Hamas wages it as well, firing a barrage of rockets that were intercepted over central Israel. How are you? Good to see you. Since last week, the U.S. Secretary of State has been on a feverish mission of crisis diplomacy. Everywhere I went, I found leaders who were determined to prevent the conflict that we're facing now from spreading. But that danger just shot up. Israel today accused of killing a senior Hezbollah commander in Lebanon. The region now bracing for a response. Now, the war in the Middle East is at the forefront of U.S. President Joe Biden's re-election campaign today when his speech to a South Carolina church congregation was interrupted. The hecklers were escorted out of the church, which erupted into chants of four more years. But Biden said he understood the heckler's passion and that he was quietly pressuring Israel's government. A wide swath of the U.S. is digging out after a wintry blast. So some areas got more than 40 centimeters of snow and more fell on parts of the Midwest today. Another storm system is expected to bring heavy snow our way from Ontario to Atlantic Canada starting tomorrow. 2023 was a very costly year for storms and severe weather, according to the Insurance Bureau of Canada. And as David Thurton shows us, not all those costs can be measured in dollars. It's been a rough year for many Canadian homeowners. The level of the water was about the one meter inside of the home. So uh, my home was uh, uh, destroyed. The spring flooding in Quebec's Charlevoix region was one weather story among many. You name it, 2023 saw it. Oh my God! Tornadoes, pelting hail, and of course, devastating wildfires. This was a pretty intense year, as Canadians know. New numbers from the Insurance Bureau of Canada show for the second year in a row, Canada exceeded $3 billion in insured damage from severe weather. The costliest, BC's Okanagan Shushwap wildfires coming in at $720 million in insured losses, followed by Ontario's severe summer storms at $340 million. Then the spring ice storm that hit Ontario and Quebec at 330 million. It's becoming an annual trend, earning Canada a reputation for being an expensive place to insure. What these numbers mean is that when insurers globally take a look at Canada, uh, they view Canada as one of the riskier places in the world to insure and to do business. 
This researcher says governments, businesses and Canadians must make neighbourhoods and homes more resistant to floods, wildfires and storms. And that's why we keep talking about climate adaptation, for example, so adapting our communities, our homes, so that insurance companies don't have to pull out of insuring our homes. Pinochet says he couldn't get flood insurance. I accept what happened and I'm going to try to do my best to to, to be um, happy in my new place and continue to make my work. His house had to be demoed and he was forced to walk away from the place he called home for 26 years. David Thurton, CBC News, Ottawa. Quebec students returning to school this week will do so without cell phones. They're now banned from classrooms. Ontario has a similar rule, though it's often ignored. Deanna Sumnak Johnson looks at why. It was honestly like night and day. Banning cell phones made all the difference at one Quebec high school, according to this history teacher. Because I didn't have to start every class with, put your phone away, put your phone in the pouch in the back, stop checking your phone. That ban now in effect for all of Quebec public schools. The province introduced it in the summer, citing a UNESCO report that found that cell phones had a negative effect on student focus, socialization and mental health. But not everyone thinks it's a good idea. Without your cell phone, it's like a big part of you is lost. And I feel like that would like stop a lot of kids from going to school. I'd like to see workshops geared towards children and their parents on uh, technology addiction. Another issue, can it be enforced? Ontario has struggled to police its ban since 2019. It's very much just like a casual ban. The student trustee says cell phones have educational value at school especially if the board can't provide each student with a laptop. But I think a better approach is teaching students the dangers of technology, how to build proper work ethic and how to manage those distractions and tune them out. In Ontario, like Quebec, enforcement is left up to each school or board. But some who work in education feel the rules need to be uniform, like the chair of Toronto District School Board, the largest in the country. If it's embedded in policy, very clear policy with very clear expectations, then I feel like it's easier for staff to say, this is TDSB policy, phones away, end of discussion. So Deanna, what's curious about this is that it seems like in places where the ban is in place, mm -hmm. it just falls on teachers to enforce it. It absolutely does. That's the one thing all teachers have told us, that what they need is the backing of their administration, which means principals and school boards, and yes, the broader school community, which includes parents. That Quebec teacher that we had in the piece, he said the reason it's working is that everybody is on the same page. Another train of thought is that you need a much more stringent ban, as in no cell phones allowed on school grounds. France has one of those. They've had it for five years. But even from there, we're getting mixed messages as to whether it's working. All right, Deanna Sumanek Johnson, thank you. Pope Francis is calling for a universal ban on surrogacy, labeling it a despicable practice that violates the dignity of women and children. Despicable, la práctica de la cosidetta maternidad surrogata. He made the comments in an annual speech, laying out what he sees as threats to global peace and human dignity. He said a baby should never be the basis of a commercial contract. The first U.S. lunar landing in five decades is in jeopardy tonight, just hours after the launch of an unmanned spacecraft. And liftoff of the first... Can the mission to the moon be salvaged? Next. Plus, tenants with the upper hand making huge demands of landlords. What went through your mind when your tenants said we're not leaving? It was just unfathomable. The six-figure sums they want just to leave. And later, a dramatic rescue in the Caribbean. I said, hold on to this as tight as you can, and I'm going to bring you back. The Montreal teens who saved a couple from drowning were back in two years. Rescuers in Slovenia right there have freed five people trapped in a cave since Saturday. The group, including two guides, got stuck about two kilometers from the entrance after heavy rain flooded the cave. Divers were able to bring in food, water and a heated tent until they could get them out safely. Tonight, the first U.S. mission to land on the moon in decades is in limbo. 
The company behind it said a critical fuel leak is threatening the ability for a safe touchdown. Paul Hunter with how it all went wrong. T minus 10, 9, 8. At the launch pad in Florida, everything sounded fine, looked good, and performed smoothly. And liftoff. From Mission Control on this first attempt by the U.S. in 50 years to land something on the moon, it was all thumbs up. Everything looking good. But then this, described as a disturbance in the insulation, an anomaly which drained the power and put the mission in jeopardy. Experts have managed to recharge the battery, but a moon landing is now unlikely. I was strolling on the moon one day. It underlines that getting to the moon is, in fact, very complicated. This is the last time Americans were there, 1972. Since then, only China, India, and the Soviet Union have safely landed spacecraft there, though no one has sent any people. This privately run U.S. endeavor is meant to put robotics on the surface ahead of NASA's Artemis program, which will send astronauts back to the moon, including Canada's Jeremy Hansen, later this year or next. But as this mission falters, there's another matter involving some other Canadians. You know, she would have loved that this occurred. It would have amused her greatly. And British Columbia's Rod Nolan and his family lost their mother in 2011. Gloria Nolan was a huge Star Trek fan, and her family was among those who'd paid to put a vial of her ashes on board the moon-bound rocket. That it's hit a snag is, in short, all good. After all, she is now out in space. Rod Nolan's message to his mom? Um, hi. <laughs> Hope you're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe where you are? Final frontier to be determined. And lift off. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Well, the Golden Globes may not have lived up to everyone's expectations, but the award show did make history. This is for every little res kid, every little urban kid, every little native kid out there who has a dream. What Lily Gladstone's win means for indigenous artists in the industry. Plus, in the battle over housing, some landlords say they're getting squeezed by their tenants. We have some tenants who ask for 100000 But others say landlords have little to complain about. Landlords have never had it better. Joanna Romiliotis looks at the growing trend of tenants demanding cash for keys. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Big difference between the Golden Globes and the NFL. On the Golden Globes, we have fewer camera shots of Taylor Swift. I swear. There's just more to go to here. Sorry about that. Please welcome. Yikes. It seems Taylor Swift wasn't the only one sort of unimpressed with Golden Globes host Joe Coy. His performance is getting generally poor reviews, but there were some high points in last night's award ceremony, including a historic win for American Indigenous actor. Lily Gladstone. Too fast. Back to Gabra Salasa now on that achievement and what it means to Indigenous artists here at home. And the Golden Globe goes to Lily Gladstone. The actor became the first Indigenous person to win a Golden Globe for Best Actress in a Motion Picture Drama. I love everyone in this room right now. <laughs> they have the worst land possible. The film Killers of the Flower Moon delves into the murders of members of the Osage Nation in the 1920s. Gladstone played the role of Molly Burkhart, who fought for her community. This is for every little res kid, every little urban kid, every little native kid out there who has a dream, who is seeing themselves represented and our stories told by ourselves in our own words um, with tremendous allies. Her message hit home for Jennifer Podemski. I just felt like I was in the bleachers, like screaming <laughs> and and hoping that this would that this would go in her favor because it represents all of us and it reflects on all of us. Some critics have questioned why Gladstone's character wasn't given more agency in the film and questioned director Martin Scorsese's graphic depiction of the killings. Still, there's plenty of praise for Gladstone's performance. She will continue to use her voice in a way that will continue to amplify the stories that are 
that are indigenous stories. Naomi Johnson is counting on that. She heads Imagine Native, the world's largest indigenous film and media arts festival. I genuinely, from my heart, I'm so happy for her and I'm sure it has inspired uh, future artists out there and filmmakers um, in their own communities. And uh, I hope that we get to show them at our festival. So. Thank you all so much. And she hopes this win will open doors for other Indigenous talent. Magda Gebra Salas, CBC News, Toronto. All right, now let's break down the news shaping our world. As Canada's housing crisis pits landlords against tenants, some renters are playing hardball, demanding cash for keys. How some tenants gain the upper hand and order landlords to pay them. We have some tenants who ask for 100000 When tenants refuse to budge, owners can forfeit the sale of their property. They ask us all the time, is this legal? Renter advocates say, suck it up. Landlords have been, you know, opening the caviar and popping the champagne. Ioana Rumiliotis breaks down how some tenants use their leverage and the heavy toll that landlords say they're forced to pay in one way or another. Cash for keys. It's when landlords offer tenants money to leave. The sky is not supposed to be the limit, but we found out it may as well be. The horror story we're hearing right now is that the tenants want an arm and a leg. Tenants are demanding lots of money to go. Tenants are just, again, using this newfound power they have um, to just get a few crumbs <laughs> from landlords. Landlords are crying foul. It's causing complete chaos. It's like the Wild West. Cash for Keys is a growing battle in Canada's housing crisis. And for smaller landlords especially, the cost is, well, going through the roof. What is it, what is it that's getting to you? Uh, the stress, the um, unknown. On a teacher's salary, Norma De Silva scrimped and saved to invest in two properties. She lives in one and rents out the other. It was my little, and little, very little nest egg. Um, I wanted to retire this year and I don't think that's going to happen. Um, like I said, the unknown, the uncertainty, it's crushing. De Silva sold her rental property in August because with rising mortgage rates, she says she couldn't afford to finance it anymore. But her buyer can't move in because her tenant won't move out. Unless De Silva makes it worth his while. What went through your mind when your tenant said, we're not leaving? It was just unfathomable. Unfathomable. Like, this is my property that I've worked so hard for and... It's like my, my property was held hostage. De Silva's investment property is a condo in this West End neighborhood in Toronto. It's a gentrified area and rents aren't cheap. De Silva says her tenant, who moved in about a year and a half ago, doesn't want to move and feels entitled to ask for a lot of money to leave because he's assuming she's going to make a profit on the sale of her condo and can afford to pay up. Sounds outrageous, maybe even illegal. We were surprised to discover how many stories like that are out there. We have some tenants who ask for 100000 some tenants who are asking for the landlord to buy a plot of land for them. We have other tenants who are asking for the landlord to purchase a property for them. It sounds ludicrous to ask a landlord for that amount of money. It is. Bita Delisi is a paralegal who is helping De Silva and many other small landlords get their cases heard at Ontario's Landlord and Tenant Board. Business is booming, and most of her new cases are cash for keys. So what's in here? So this cabinet alone is our hearing cabinet for okay. 2024. This is January. 2024 for next year. These are the ones this you're waiting. This is all for next year. Wow. So this has been a big increase. Huge increase. Going back to 2020, where we almost had about 400 cash for keys cases, mm -hmm. to this year alone, where we have almost 1,000 cases. What's behind the increase? The ripple effects of the interest rates. Oftentimes, landlords who purchase properties purchase them at the time with variable rates. And now that the rates have increased, and the rents don't carry those expenses, 
Landlords have no choice but to list and sell. Well, if you have a tenant who knows their rights and who knows that they're, they don't have to leave because they have the right to remain in the unit until a hearing is held. And that's the issue. Getting a hearing for an eviction order at the landlord and tenant board can take months because of a backlog of tens of thousands of cases. Landlords complain a growing number of tenants are trying to cash in on those delays, and that's backing more landlords into corners. We deal with a lot of small landlords, a lot of landlords that come to us in tears, a lot of small landlords that come to us with their keys and say, you know, Bita, here are my keys, I can't do it anymore. There's huge, significant financial losses for some landlords, especially the smaller landlord. Delisi and her team meet every week to update each other on their cases. They say tenants are not only demanding more, sometimes they're refusing to pay rent until they get what they want. Police, they say, can't do anything about it. Only the board can resolve disputes between landlords and tenants. Like, I have landlords crying that I'm broke, that tenants owe me 60-something in rent, and I have to pay two mortgages, interest rates, uh, renewal of the mortgages and don't have a hearing date yet. It's up to nine months right now. What are some of the words that the landlords are using? Extortion. Extortion, Extortion is the main fair. one. Why should I pay them this yeah. money? They ask us all the time, is this legal? Fix the LTV. The short answer, despite landlords growing frustration, it is legal to negotiate a cash for keys deal. And while landlords call it fraud, the long delays at the board are giving tenants the upper hand. Tenant advocates say it's about time. Any landlord complaining to me about the landlord and tenant board can go pound sand. Jordy uh, Dent is the executive director of the Federation of Metro Tenants, tenants Association. There is absolutely more tenants that are um, using kind of um, this kind of landlord and tenant board delay um, because it's put a lot of landlords in a box. Um, but again, that's not a bad thing from our perspective. Dent says more people than ever struggle to pay skyrocketing rents and are fed up. Call it renter's revenge. On online forums, tenants encourage each other to get as much as they can from their landlords before handing over their keys. Some people are asking for six figures. Others Great. are asking for a plot of land or a Great. down payment on a house. Uh, absolutely, that's wonderful. You know, Why do you think that's wonderful? Um, because they have the right to do that. Uh, look, uh, the, a lot of these people, myself included, are paying tens of thousands of dollars for a place to live and a place to rent. Um, when you pay that money, it doesn't just go into the ether. You get rights for that. Now, landlords have been using their rights to get a good deal for decades um, through the entire rental crisis that we're going through. Landlords have been, you know, opening the caviar and popping the champagne. Dent says eviction fraud is the number one complaint his group deals with. Tenants, he says, are often pushed out so landlords can jack up the rent or sell and make a profit. He has no sympathy for any landlord, big or small. What do you say to the landlords who basically saved up their money to buy a property and who now might lose that property? We're not talking to millionaires. What do you say to the mom and pop landlords who are suffering as a result of this? I, I tell them to learn about investment risk. Okay. Again, I don't really focus on the individual mom and pop landlords. I look at the overall market. Okay. And if you look at the overall market today, landlords have never had it better. It is a golden age of profit, uh, increased equities in their home, uh, tax cuts and tax credits. They are living large right now. If you take a look at the tenant population, tenants are getting absolutely hammered. They're paying exorbitant rents. They're getting evicted left, right and center. They can't enforce their rights. Uh, again, that's the population that I mostly care about. So your message to landlords then is suck it up. That's, that's the risk that comes with an investment? My message to landlords is welcome to what tenants have been living with for the last two decades. So yes, uh, when a landlord has to struggle who's in a million, you know, who's in far better condition than almost any tenant I know, yeah, I'm going to tell them to suck it up. When we come back just how intense the high-pressure tactics can get. And he's like, pay me $50,000, I will get out next month. For landlords already under strain, tenants withholding rent is hard enough, but things can get even more difficult. And he's like, 
pay me $50,000, I will get out next month. I was like, what? One woman shows Joanna just how far cash for keys demands can go. There's no official count of how many tenants are trying to leverage cash for keys deals or the damage it can cause. But choosing not to pay can be even riskier. It's a three, three bedroom ish, okay. but I think. Pema Zella is finally in her home. But she says she's lost tens of thousands of dollars, even though she refused to pay her tenant to go. I wasn't willing to pay even a penny for a person who is trying to scam, take advantage of the system, take advantage of people like us. Zella and her family had rented out their home for a year. But when it was time for her daughter to start school nearby, she gave her tenant notice. He refused to leave and stop paying rent. While she waited months for a hearing, her tenant offered her a deal. He said that, you know, we can negotiate. I'm like, what do you mean we can negotiate? You already owe me more than $20,000. What do you mean? And he's like, pay me $50,000, I will get out next month. I had, I had uh, pain in my stomach. I was like, what? $50,000 and you will get out? How dare you even say that? This year? Because of those board delays, it took a year and a half for Zella to finally get an eviction order. But get this, when she came to deliver it, her tenant was not here, but a bunch of strangers were. How many people were here when you came? When you with the order, with the eviction order? One, two, three, four. Four people? Yeah. And no sign of your actual tenant? No. But these people had paid him rent? Yes. Yeah. So those are the damage. Besides the damages, by the time they finally got into their own house, Zella's tenant owed $40,000 in unpaid rent. And on top of that, she says, he made money off her property while she was going broke. You didn't expect this to happen in Canada. And there's no accountability to, to the landlord, to the tenant like him, right? Mm -hmm. But we are suffering. Hardworking, honest citizen, trying to survive in Canada. We're, we're suffering for, for no apparent reason. The inability of the landlord and tenant board to tackle this and to get on schedule is causing this like subculture of lawlessness. De Silva's financial strain is only getting worse. She says she spent tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees and paying her buyer's Airbnb costs until the sale closes in March. She's been hoping to get a hearing at the board to get her tenant out by then or risks losing the sale. I mean, I know the rights that tenants have, but when I think of how hard I've worked to create a responsible existence, and to have that pulled up from under me is, is hard to swallow. And someone else controlling that, you know? So, Joanna, there's so much more to this story, but can we talk about Norma Da Silva for a moment? What's the latest with her? Well, she finally got a hearing scheduled at the end of this month after five months of waiting. Now, if her case gets resolved in that single day, it still means that she might have to wait up until a month to get an eviction order and longer to get a sheriff to enforce it if her tenant doesn't leave willingly. So that's what she was looking at and decided she might be running out of time before her buyer bails. So she decided to settle with her tenant for an undisclosed amount. She said that's the terms of the agreement, that those, those, that number is confidential. So that's where she's at. So as we talk about the landlord-tenant board constantly re referring to the delays, what's the status of those wait times now? Well, there, there was a backlog of nearly 40,000 cases last spring, and we've tried to get an answer on what is the number of cases now in backlog, and we just haven't been able to get that information from the board. What it did tell us was that it has hired 60 new people, adjudicators, part-time and full-time, to help streamline and get cases heard more quickly, and that it has also streamlined their processes to help that make that happen. And, you know, you've given us some really strong 
personal experiences here, but, but if we step back, do you have a sense of, of how many smaller landlords m might be in this situation? We don't have a real sense because nobody is calculating it, but we do know from paralegals that their numbers have spiked. What, another way to look at it is how many smaller landlords are out there. And according to a Statistics Canada report in 2020, about 8% of Canadians' households reported rental income, renting out an investment property or a basement suite in, the, in their primary home. And among those people, among the smaller landlords, that number has increased over the years because of lower interest rates and people could afford to buy an investment property. Properties that people are now trying to offload because of the interest rates. And because of that, they're also looking for tenants. If they can't offload it, they're looking for tenants who can pay higher rent. So that's why the situation is, is so tricky for people who are in this boat. But tricky too, because tenants are, are so vulnerable right now. They totally are. And this cash for keys phenomena is simply a symptom of a broken housing, of a, of a broken housing system and a housing crisis. It's really hard for anybody to find an affordable place to live. And if your landlord wants you out, it is really hard to find somebody somewhere else to go. Ioana Romiliotis, thank you for doing this. Thank you. So as the housing crisis continues, we're going to keep following stories like these. If you're a landlord or a tenant in a difficult situation, you can reach out to The National at cbc.ca. And coming soon on The National, pandemic payback. Billions in federal COVID relief loans to Canadian small businesses are coming due. But some owners say that right now, paying that money back could break them. The store is my life. It's how I make a living. It's my pension. It's my retirement. It's it's everything. You're all set. Great. A Mercer's divine intervention. There's just no way we're able to pay this back by the 18th of January. It's just it's just not going to happen. What would you call that number? Loss for a government. Loss revenues. Loss income. That's half a million dollars. One small business. There are employees that are going to lose their jobs and their income. I'm going to lose my livelihood. My family is going to suffer. There's a lot at stake here. The growing calls for pandemic loan forgiveness. Look for that story in the days ahead on The National. Coming up, when a couple found themselves on the verge of drowning off the coast of Barbados, two Canadian teens jumped into action. I said, hold on to this as tight as you can, and I'm going to bring you back. Their heroic rescue is next in our moment. So you're looking at Emma and Zoe. They are two teens from Montreal, and currently they're in Barbados, where Emma is training for the Olympics as a swimmer. So that training definitely came in handy. While they were out boogie boarding recently, they came across a couple who were caught in a dangerous tide, and without any lifeguard present, they knew what they had to do. Their courage and quick thinking is our moment. Well, it was a beautiful day, as you can imagine, a bit windy. We didn't think anything of it. We'd been in the sea off this particular beach many times. Robert said, oh, we're drifting a bit. I was swimming and swimming and not getting anywhere. And I think, oh, I'm caught in a riptide. And I said, help, help. And these two young girls at the end of the beach, one of them looks over and she comes towards me. I'm shouting, no, get a lifeguard. And she said, there aren't any lifeguards. I put her onto my boogie board and I said, hold on to this as tight as you can and I'm going to bring you back. And the woman was talking about how her husband was further out and he couldn't swim very well. So me and Zoe, we went back out. She was like, no, you're too little. You won't be able to. He's a big guy. But when I got the husband, I tied the strap that came from the boogie board onto my ankle because I figured it would be easier. And we swam until we could touch the sand. Zoe and Emma saved our lives. There's no two ways about it. Uh, good for you. Uh, the couple say, hey, listen, Zoe and Emma, anytime you're in London, consider their home your second home. Zoe says she got a great tip from her parents a long time ago. If you're ever caught in a tide like that, don't try to swim against it. Swim parallel to the shore, and eventually it will lessen, and you can go in. That stuck with her. It's a good thing it did. For all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrienne Arsenal. Take care.